depending on where you are in the world. Um, my name is Sohil Seard. I'm, I'm one of the faculty members at UCSF, and it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you to this second week of the Global Child Health Lecture Series. Um, and since we're at the start of the week, maybe I'll just take one brief moment, if it's okay, to um, I'll put this link in the chat. But for those interested in joining us for lectures throughout the week, um, we are starting on Monday, 919, and have a great series of topics that we're covering today. And then uh, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday are off, and then Thursday and Friday, there's a few more lectures here. So um, if you're interested, please feel free to, to register via the Zoom meeting link, and just note all times are, of course, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, but today, it's absolutely uh, my pleasure to welcome two fantastic colleagues from Partners in Health, uh, based in uh, the, the branch that works in Peru. Um, Liberty Wickman, who's the chief training officer there, and Nancy Romaldo, who's the child and infant health project coordinator there, to uh, come chat with us about decolonized approaches for participation in global health intervention um, and their experiences with the child health program in Lima, Peru. Um, and so with that, uh, maybe Liberty and Nancy, if I can turn it over to you uh, to share a little bit more about yourselves and then, um, and then would love to hear what you have to share with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sohil. We're honored to be to be here with you all um, and so grateful for the invite. Uh, so I can introduce myself first and then I'll pass the mic to my colleague, Nancy. So um, I'm Liberty Wickman, Chief Training Officer of the Center for Global Health at Socios and Salud, which is a new initiative that launched during the pandemic two years ago. Um, currently, our Center for Global Health is fully focused on training, but in the future, we'll launch a clinical component and a research component as well. Um, and it's just one of the many programs that Socios and Salud has to offer in Peru. And we'll give you a little bit more information on Partners in Health and Socios and Salud and the Center in just a few minutes. Um, but just so you have a little bit more background about who I am, um, I have worked for Partners in Health for five years now. I spent three years at our site in Mexico in Chiapas um, and then transferred to the Peru team just two years ago. And prior to working with Partners in Health, I worked with a small medical NGO in Peru for five years. Um, so I have a long history in global health, even though I'm not um, a clinical professional. So I'll pass the microphone to Nancy to introduce herself as well. Thank you so much. Well, uh, my name is Nancy Rumaldo. I am nutritionist and, and actually infant health project coordinator in Socios and Salud. I work in Socios and Salud since 2013, and I started with the Casita project. Uh, was my first experience in research and in the intervention in community inter intervention, and really. Um, I have more experience too in to know to have more knowledge in HIV and in mental health program. What's very interesting. I finished my master in social program management in Cayetano Heredia. And in the la, in 2021, I was selected to Atlantic Fellow for Health Equity in George Washington University. And I really am. Um, I am so happy to, to work with this topic and to create more opportunities for the for my community every day. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Oh, I think that video is gonna start automatically. Um, so just to give you a little bit of information on Partners in Health, because I'm not sure how much background you all have on our organization. Um, Partners in Health was founded around 30 years ago. Um, primarily focused in, in Haiti at the beginning and then expanding to Peru. And we're now um, based in 11 countries around the world, I think. We have um, sites in Liberia, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Rwanda, Lesotho, um, as well as Peru, Mexico, and Haiti, Kazakhstan, and Russia. Um, and recently we've expanded to, to various states in the United States as well. And we have a fundraising office in Canada as well. Um, and so our organization was founded um, in, in the Alma Ata Principles for Global Health, which is a, a model for comprehensive primary health care. Um, and our 
theory of change focuses on accompaniment of patients and acknowledging the social determinants of care and not just the diagnosis when providing patient-centered care. Um, and we partner directly with ministries of health and all of our projects so that we can try and create sustainable change um, that can be scaled up to reach all populations in the country and not just the small sector that we may, might start working with in, in a country when we first launch a project there. Um, and then Socios and Salud was the second site of Partners in Health to be founded. So Socios was founded 25 years ago and was focused primarily on multidrug resistant tuberculosis. Um, and so uh, Paul Farmer and Jim Kim, two of the key founders of Partners in Health, um, spent a couple of years really focused on, on Peru and advocating for treatment for multidrug resistant TB um, because at the time the World Health organizations um, suggested um, norms for care, uh, said that MDRTB was too expensive and too complicated to administer in impoverished communities. And so um, anyone who had that diagnosis was basically sent home to die. Um, and so, so Paul and Jim worked on a global scale to advocate for a shift in, in treatment models. Um, and they actually helped bring treatment costs from $20,000 per patient down to $2,000 per patient and, and really revolutionized MDR-TB care, not only in Peru, but around the world. Um, and Socius and Salud still has a strong emphasis in TB in, in Peru, um, but also works in community health, mental health, social protection, COVID, HIV, um, and now training as well, and, and health research in the country. Um, and then our Center for Global Health, as I mentioned, launched just two years ago, and we are currently focused on training. So we offer international webinars, courses, boot camps, um, volunteer and clinical rotation experiences, as well as scholarships um, to make sure that we're providing equitable opportunities to all involved. And our services reach medical professionals, community health workers, patients and, and interested students who are still just starting undergrad and deciding what they'd like to do for their professional career. Um, and I have two just really short, quick videos to try and reinforce that information. I know it's still really early in the morning in California. And so um, I thought these, these videos might be a way to kind of wake us up and, um, and really drive that message home before we move forward in our presentation. Oh, I think I need to share my computer sound. Where healthcare is not a privilege, but a human right. Where care is not conditional, but guaranteed. Where no patient is left behind. For more than 30 years, Partners in Health has made it our mission to create this world. From the bedside to the halls of power, we have spoken up when world leaders fell silent, taking a stand when others wouldn't. Delivered care once thought impossible because healthcare can't wait, and neither can justice. The Center for Global Health seeks to break down barriers and access to global health education through an open and active international intervention, offering high quality educational opportunities and sharing content that addresses the major public health issues and social determinants that affect the most vulnerable communities internationally. Join more than 15,000 users from 120 countries and participate in courses and events led by internationally renowned global health leaders. Look us up at the Center for Global Health website and follow us on social media today.
And I'll go ahead and share in the chat as well the links to our, our varied websites. And I'm happy to share my contact information if anyone would like further information on our organizations. And I think we'll have time for some Q&A at the end of the session as well. Imagine. A okay. So today um, we're going to be focusing primarily on decolonization and on infant and child health programs in Peru. Um, and, and the reason that we have this, this decolonization focus in our, our presentation today is because I recently completed my master's degree and my thesis was focused on six months of research around decolonizing global health. Um, and, and we wanted to contextualize it to, to your work as, as pediatric residents. Um, and so I invited Nancy to, to help me contextualize it in, in pediatric medicine. Um, and so one of the key um, kind of facts that I like to give about global health and, and remnant colonization in, in global health um, is looking at global health leadership around the world. Um, so that the map that you see on the right side of the screen here is a map of, of headquarters of global health organizations. Um, and so you can see the majority are based in the global north and of global health leaders. And um, so like director level and CEO level positions in global health organizations, 84% um, of global health leaders are from the global north. Um, and then of that less than 20% that are from the global south, 10% um, of them were trained in the global north. So they achieved their university or higher level degree um, in the United States or Europe to be considered qualified for the position that they occupy. Um, and so, so looking at where our global health organizations are headquartered and who our leadership is, um, is, is a very clear framework to understand what the remnant colonization is in, in global health and that the majority of global health projects and funding are dedicated towards um, implement, implementation initiatives in the global south. Um, and so to, to de decolonize global health, we'll need to lift up local leaders um, in the global south in the future. Um, and a key step in, in doing so is creating educational programs for global health in the global south, um, which is the, the inspiration behind our Center for Global Health Training Unit, um, is to empower and train local leaders for global health leadership in the global south. Um, and so as part of my, my thesis research, we interviewed various global health professionals from around the world, um, leaders of different organizations and, and well-known physicians, um, both from the Global North and Global South. And I have a couple of their quotes here on the screen for you today from those, those interviews. Um, and, and these were kind of their, like, their, their key phrases in driving home the need for decolonizing global health. Um, and the three that are selected here on the screen are from leaders who are based in the Global South. Um, and so they said that a lot of interventions are done for the Global South and not with the Global South in Global Health. Um, and that was said by Dr. Tanache Koronga, who's a pediatrician in Zimbabwe. Um, and Dr. Hugo Flores from Mexico said, I think that what colonization is in practice today is that we give you money and you do what we say. Um, and so that would be like large um, funders and donors in, in the, the US and in Europe. Um, so like USAID, um, the MacArthur Foundation, Johnson and Johnson, and some of those, those key donors in, in the world of global health um, who give funding in a very restricted manner to global health organizations. Um, and then when our fin that final quote there is, when you have countries saying that's good enough for them, um, that's not good at all. So when thinking about global health, we want to make sure that we're maintaining standards of care that are the same standards of care for us at home in the global north as in the global south. Um, and then I don't have much time to go into it, but another good way to understand remnant coloniality in global health is to look at the history of coloniality in global health or look at the history of global health itself. Um, so, so global health is rooted in colonial medicine, which started in 300 BC with the conquest of the Iberian Peninsula um, and has just grown and changed throughout the years. Um, and when it was really identified and, and known as colonial medicine um, was, was during the era of colonization and 
a French colonial strategist. This is a quote that I'm reading and I'll share. I have a, a references page at the end here. Um, the French colonial strategist Herbert Laiauti said that the only excuse for colonization is medicine. The doctor, if he understands his role, is the most effective of our agents for penetration and pacification. And so, so when a when a country was first colonizing a new territory, um, his strategy was to send in the doctors first um, and gain the trust of the community and then bring in the army and exploit the community. And that's kind of like the core root in the history of global health, international medicine and, and beyond. Um, and in modern day, while we have global health, international health, tropical medicine that are all very well intended, and um, we still have to acknowledge the past that we that we came from, and um, because those are the original structures that we've built off of to to reach where we are today. Um, and so, so each of those kinds of different sectors of doing health abroad um, have have their own kind of dark pasts and and good intentions today um, that make this a really complex um, professional area to work in. Um, so international health, for example, um, was originally called the British Colonial Medical Services um, and was responsible. So in the name of international medicine, um, physicians in, oh, I have the year written down here. Uh, oh, I don't have the year written down. Um, but physicians in, in Africa pub published a report saying that native Africans were better prepared for heavy lifting and hot climates than white colonizers. Um, and at the same time, considered them dirty and uncivilized. And they used this medical um, report as a way to justify slavery moving forward. Um, and so this, this report was given just before the slave trade really picked up. Um, and so, so we need to really acknowledge what our roots are um, in, the, in the field of global health to understand how we're going to, to move forward and decolonize global health. Um, so I don't think that we have very much time to go through other historical examples, but um, when we get to the Q&A, if anyone would like to hear examples of some of these other versions of global health in the past, let me know and I'm, I'm happy to share more examples. Um, and so, so that brings me to some of these modern initiatives for decolonizing global health. Um, and before I really dive into them, an explanation of, of the map on the right hand side um, shows where the financing is for global health. So who holds the money in their bank accounts for global health initiatives? And as you can see, it's it's very much based in the global north, even though the majority of our implementation projects are taking place in the global south. Um, so, so in our initiatives for decolonizing global health, um, we're looking at paradigm shifts, so shifts in um, perspectives and control of financing and power between high income countries and low and middle income countries, as well as shifts in priority. So who gets to set the priorities for global health initiatives? Should it be the global north um, or should it be the global south? Um, we re I recently attended a conference with, with USAID and they were talking about the priorities for the next year being biosecurity. Um, and and one of our local partners that was based in South America raised their hand and asked, like, do you think that we'll ever be able to set our own priorities for this financing that you're offering? Um, which I thought was a very point question and that um, the funding that USAID can offer is, is incredible. It can really make a huge difference for a global health organization and really help them reach a larger scale of beneficiaries. Um, but most global health organizations, or at least the implementers in the global south, aren't the ones that are getting to decide um, what the priorities for that financing are, so how that money is going to be spent. Um, and then representation, so again talking about who the leaders are in global health and where our global health educational institutions are for empowering and training those future leaders. Um, and then once we build up leaders in the global south, we can then um, create larger um, structural and, and political changes in global health. Um, looking at knowledge and education. So another really key key fact about colonial remnant colonial remnant coloniality in global health. Um, sorry, my first meeting today was in Spanish, so my adjectives and 
and nouns are, are flipped in my brain right now. Um, so um, another key fact about remnant coloniality and global health can be seen in research in global health. And um, so there was a study that was done from 2015 to 2020 and um, where they looked at more than 2000 papers published in the name of global health. So in global health journals or with the word global health in their title and only 10% of those 2000 papers had a first author that was from the global south. And 90% of the papers were published with first authors from the global north. So that's another way that we can monitor um, power dynamics in, in global health. Um, and then I'm going to share in the chat, we don't have time to watch the video. It's a six minute clip. Dr. Madhukar Pai at the 2002-2022 AIDS conference this year in Canada um, gave a really powerful talk on decolonization and global health. Um, and, and one of the, the key phrases that I pulled from that was that every single aspect of global health was designed to benefit the global north. I um, mean, he goes on to explain that a little bit more. Um, but the, the key points that he tried to make towards the end of that speech are that we have two options for decolonizing global health, and that is that the, the global south needs to assert themselves as leaders in global health. Um, but for them to do that, the global north needs to get out of the way and be, be better allies, basically. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and, and pass Nancy the microphone now to talk about one specific global health program that we can kind of use as a framework to, to discuss how up and coming global health professionals from the global north can get involved in, in programs in the global south in a, a decolonized manner. Um, so without further ado, Nancy, um, te paso el micro, gracias. Thank you so much, Liberty, for, the, for all this information. Uh, well, um, today I will talk about with Casita, uh, about Casita. The short name is Casita, but the large name is implementation of a community-based model of early child development in children between six and 24 months old in Lima, Peru. Uh, I really, we, we started this project in 2030 in Lima, Peru, and we received this, the technical support, the research of Harvard and Brigham and Women Hospital. Was very interesting, really, because uh, we create uh, one ex, uh, one intervention, uh, but in the in the way we add more details of the context of Peru, and was very interesting. I talk more about in the next slides. The next, please. Okay, well, uh, this is a short part. Socios and Salud have many programs, uh, tuberculosis, mental health, maternal and child health. Uh, when we, uh, in child health, it, it includes early childhood development. Other topics is HIV and LGTB, non chronic disease and cancer, no? Uh, all our programs are focused in uh, Caraballo district. Uh, Caraballo is an old district in metropolitan Lima and is one of the districts more large in, in Peru. And this is a picture about Caraballo and ha, this district has a particular characteristic because this district has a rural and urban area. And can you imagine all the difference uh, of the, in this community, how the people live, how the people have uh, the food, how the people um, uh, can be to, to work in different works. It's very interesting because uh, this, this combination of the people is, uh, can be create more strategies and different uh, model of the interventions. The next, please. Well, why Casita project? Casita project uh, started in, two, in 2013. And in that moment, uh, the problem with early childhood development uh, was not a public health problem in Peru. In Peru was undernutrition, stunting, or iron deficiency in children. 
And, but we uh, uh, create in Peru a new ministry called Inclusion Minister and Development. And this ministry work exclusively in early childhood development. And for, for us, that's very helpful because we could create more intervention in this topic. Well, uh, now Peru is considered a middle-income country. Uh, there is still a large number of people who live in constant social vulnerability, and it is a them uh, on whom we concentrate our efforts. Our priorities are vulnerable groups who beyond poverty live in a situation of risk. For example, the maternal and child health indicate a 157 maternal deaths for want uh, live births. A figure that has been decreasing in the last five years. Uh, but uh, for example, in Peru, six million people live in poverty. Is almost that 20% of the people in Peru. 46% uh, of night and 12 month old babies have adequate interaction with their mothers. 4% of children under three years of age have iron deficiency or anemia. And all these, um, all these values in Peru percentage are really very, um, is show us that it's necessary to continue work in this topic. The next please. And what is CASITA? CASITA is a community-based early intervention adapted from a SPARC Center in Boston Medical Center. Uh, it is the delivery of 12 educational sessions led, led by a community health workers to caregivers and their children from six to 24 months identified with risk or development delight. For us, the community health worker is the heart of our interventions. And all this process to, to adapt from Spark Center and them in Peru was very interesting because we, we received the intervention, the package of this intervention um, in an intervention individual sessions face to face. But in the process, we changed, changed these ideas, changed this process because we collect data from the community people, from the community health worker, the champions leaders in the community, for the people of the local government. And we introduce more details of the context of Peru, specifically of Caraballo. Uh, next, please. How work CASITA process? First, the training of community health worker. We, uh, we have a specific uh, methodology for train, call it proficiency and fidelity. It's very interesting this process because um, when we work with them, uh, we not only try to, okay, I teach different topics in early childhood development or nutrition or other topics. First, we uh, bring a theory and then we, um, we, film uh, the community health worker when practice with in the sessions. And then we ask, okay, tell me, uh, for example, Melby, the community health worker, how, how do you feel during your sessions? And Melby maybe tell me, Nancy, uh, really, I was so uh, afraid because I was nervous. Okay, maybe we need to, we need to um, repeat the practice. Yes, I need, okay, okay. And we, we uh, we discovered in, in every session the potential of this community health worker and to ensure that the liver of this intervention casita at the caregivers. No, this process is very interesting, really. In our second point uh, is uh, the search for the child from six to 24 months and evaluation with the EEDP to identify risk or delay in psychomotor development. Uh, this process is the door for the for, for the family at our project. Because we, first we uh, search in the community, uh, all the children that can be, cannot access at the health center. And we applied uh, this, 
this questionnaire called EEDP, it's a local questionnaire. And then uh, we, if the child is identified with risk or the lake, we invite to our intervention casita. Our three process is deliver of the 12 educational sessions led by the community health worker. This is the principal package of casita uh, when we work so strong uh, the interaction the caregiver with the child, uh, with games, with practice, with different um, activities. <clears throat> the four, the four, uh, the four point of the four process in Casita is uh, we not work only alone. We work with different programs in, in social and salute, like the mental health program and social protection program. We identify uh depression anxiety and and domestic violence in the caregivers and in the parents in the fathers too and other point is if we identify family with um, condition vulnerability or in poverty we try to create uh new strategies that can be to generate more recourse and other is the bring support economical too how this is the, the 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 complete panorama of casita is the holistic we try to involvement not only the families uh, not only the caregiver and the child we try to involvement of other uh, other uh, people of the community like to leader like to health center people or the local government yes because we believe that the principal uh, the principal decision um, over the child is not only to the mother, mm -hmm. it's for the many peoples in the environment. Next, please. Well, and how is the Casita session structure? This is, uh, this is very interesting. It's, I talk about that third process, like the decisions. Um, first is presentation of the participant and quest, complex with the rules of, of coexistence, uh, initial motivation activity, interaction gave in the in the areas. We have we create an educational module module when we work more about the interaction of the serve and return. Uh, on, in all this moment of the session, they practice serve and return interaction. And maybe I can be too. Can, can you, Liberty, please to uh, to play the video? It's a short video. Hello. I don't, uh, maybe I can I can see so fast, but uh, I really um, this this expression that the the caregiver and the child this moment is uh, a part of the self and return practice when the mother can be to see the child uh, face to face can be touch and we try to practice other interaction like to interactions like to kisses and and hugs no it's very interesting to how we how they can interactions with their child and other important point during the casita session structure is the emotional support to caregivers and when the the caregiver can be talk about the personal problems or maybe a specific uh, situation in her family. And this is very helpful because the other caregivers can be bring support emotional and the community health worker to uh, bring support, but it's more that other caregivers that maybe can be, a, can stay in the same situation and bring support. It's very interesting how they come to, to, to talk about a specific topic. The next, please. We uh, create evidence about that. 
we started Casita in 2013 uh, with we, we Pilot Casita, but in 2016, uh, we uh, create a other scaling of Casita with Grand Challenge Finance Support too. And we use all these questionnaires in uh, relation with the early childhood development, with psychomotor development, and the other instrument was home, uh, when we identified the parental responsibility and parental involvement. And the local questionnaire was evaluation the psychomotor development, EDP. And for depression, we used pat, uh, patient health questionnaire, PHQ, in Peru. And we create two articles about our experience. You know? How, uh, what one we demonstrate? Uh, we demonstrate that one community health worker training with accompaniment uh, and constant accompaniment, not only for the team, is for the caregivers, uh, really can be change the life of one child. No, and this is so important for us because we empower empowerment of the community health worker. And this is very important for this process because they now are not only uh, leaders in the community, it's more than that. It's the people that can be talk with the local government and to say, okay, I need more support for my community in this topic. I can be to, to maybe more, um, more activities in the community for the for my family can be they can uh, a voice for for her for their child and this is uh this is very very amazing for us no the power of the community health worker and and how can we grow every year because many of our community health workers uh, in these moments, uh, work with with us, work it with us, work with us since eight eight years ago. No, like the, since pilot, and this is what's very important. Next, please. Well, uh, today I talk about uh, context COVID. Well. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic in Peru has revealed several limitations in the health system, especially in medical equipment and human resources. Human resources were relocated from their original jobs to attend the pandemic, essential services such as prenatal care, vaccines, and child growth and development services to be partially or totally suspended. This scenario is already by affecting the health of a whole generation, and it's uh, physically observed in the current diphtheria outbreak in Peru. Well, that was in 2020, but these cases disappear. Thanks, God. Um, faced with this situation, Casita adapted its, uh, its model, where we are flexible in the face of challenges, recognizing the importance of being flexible and that um our model is adapted to fit the changing needs to community thus we developed the casita bot a mobile application that allows us to identify children between 6 and 24 months of age at risk in their development by asking their caregiver questions and other was a question about the child's age, prematurity, diagnosis of anemia, and child nutritional status as perceived by the caregiver. Uh, also provides an educational platform about child care and emotional care for the caregiver. And well, this, this uh, really was so important because uh, during the pandemic was difficult the access of the families and the Casita vote was very helpful to identify uh, the people in the community for to, to deliver other sessions. Uh, all children identified with this development risk at risk are contacted by our team and invite to participate in CASITA virtual sessions. We have developed uh, videos that show self and return interactions with local families and have produced 
shortly videos with message on nutrition and emotional care for the caregivers. Uh, the next, please. This is the educational uh, material training, training videos in serve and return, videos in early stimulation, flyer and clips like to uh, hand washing or maybe the specific moments to create interaction in the families. And this is the slide of chatbot. In this moment, uh, we are not used this chatbot, only principal was used in the, in the, um, during the pandemic in 2020 and 2021. Uh, and now we are uh, come back to the face-to-face -face intervention. Next, please. Oh, well, what is the main milestone of CASITA? 2016, agreement with Caraballo Municipality, our district uh, when we started CASITA, presentation of results in the GCC annual conference, the Grand Challenge Canada. They are, they was, they were our, finance support. And, and we just start of the CASITA program to scaling. Our goal was 6,000 6, children evaluated and 3,000 children served. It really was a challenge, but was possible because we not only work with the Grand Challenge Canada, we work with the local government, with the private institutions in Peru, uh, like to drug stores, or other institution that can be interested in the early childhood development. In 2018, we uh, obtained the publication of the results of CASITA pilot, and we implemented of new strategies, mental health, clinical and socioeconomic socio support, and the reduction of anemia, iron deficiency. In 2019, we, we have the prize for good public management practice, of the institution citizens of the to date, and CASIT expanded to two new districts in Peru with the support of municipality of Metropolitan Lima, and uh, we obtained annual external funding from Abbey Foundation. Uh, this process for funding external was very interesting because we uh, they they asked, okay, what do you want to do in in, in Peru? And we decided we want we want to continue work in Casita because I really we trust in the facts in the results and they ask okay you tell me what do you need and I I try to identify uh, support for this intervention and was possible no and they was a match to obtain the 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 goals. In 2020-21 was the COVID pandemics. Um, we, um, we implement our new strategy called parental competence that they work with the care of the children in the family. And we obtain other prize for a successful experience during the COVID-19 with PAHO. And we, we obtained the publication of the results of CASIT scaling. And in 2022, for us was, is, this is recently, is, we started in the last year, in, in the last year, the last month in October, uh, we decided to implement Casita in Cusco. Cusco is a rural zone of Peru, it's all the region, it's not Lima, and we, we had many challenges in the process, but very interesting because it was very interesting because we obtain many um, many relations, many connections with the uh, different actors in the community. In the community, uh, for example, local government, the health center people, and uh, was uh, was interesting how can be involved more people external in this process, no? Like volunteers like uh, research in research uh, people because usually Casita work in Lima, but now Casita work in, in, in Cusco too. Next, please. Well, uh, just talk about the volunteer experience of Casita. Uh, we, 
we had the privilege to work with volunteers of different universities in the world, Harvard, Dartmouth, San Martin de Porres in Peru, Mount Holyoke, Mount Sinai University of Edinburgh and Rochester University. And uh, really we work not only with, uh, with pre-grade professionals, we work with post-grade professionals like the University of Edinburgh and um, University of Rochester. What's very uh, interesting that all this process and the difference. The next, please. Okay, volunteer experience at Casita. This is uh, some pictures about that work. Uh, in this work in the community of Cusco, interview as the as the people, uh, a community health worker. Uh, this he is a medical professional. He uh, who works with us in telemedicine during during pandemic. Uh, volunteer for medicine presentials uh, in the field. Uh, collect data, and this is in the casita sessions. Bring support to the to the external visits and to to bring support to the community health worker. I think next. I really this. I don't know. Say exists a other slide. Um, okay. Okay, what is the advantage in that in this process we to work with volunteer? I think that exists more advantage than disadvantage. Uh, but really, uh, is the specialized support for project activities, implementation of new strategies. For example, we create a, a strategy in gender equity with the volunteer of Edinburgh University. Uh, we can to identify new research opportunities like the telemedicine and mental health. Um, they can be interaction with the community and it's a real context. I remember when uh, one volunteer told me in one moment, Nancy, maybe I cannot to visit uh, the touristic place in Cusco, but I, I enjoy the life, the real life in the community because it's different like to all the people show us how is Cusco is different and this was very interesting for us because this 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 is a great experience for them they can be interaction with the community they can be to apply the knowledge uh, they can to they can to practice in the community uh, but they can not only uh, to practice they can to to create more strategies when they talk with the community too. Um, greater command of the Spanish language uh, and for us uh, can be permit the variety in the delivery of the intervention, virtual and face-to-face. -face. Well, uh, in the disadvantage, maybe it's short volunteer times that limit the activities to be carried out. Some, some volunteers stay in Peru for three months, other for six months, another for one year. And these, these activities can be to involvement more time in the other activities. And, uh, and in others, it's only a specific activities for the time. And I feel that, that, that this is the, a good experience in general um, and, and well. Uh, if, obviously, if that is the language, no? Uh, because if the people don't speak the Spanish, maybe take more time to, to learn in this language and to communicate with the people in the community too. Uh, I think that is this all. Thanks, Nancy. Thanks. It's a really cute picture. Um, so I know we're getting short on time and I, I wanna make sure that we can take a couple of questions. Um, I just wanted to kind of summarize here the impact of, of volunteers and clinical rotations and external researchers um, traveling to Peru to work with Socios and Salud or to work with the organization that I spent five years with prior to, to joining Partners in Health. Um, and, and from what I've, I've witnessed in, in Mexico as well, working with the team there, um, and then also what I learned from interviewing global health professionals around the world, um, kind of the summarized points of if as a pediatric resident or a professional, you would like to travel to the global south um, to work in a global health 
setting, um, whether that be short term or long term, um, the, the general recommendations are to, to pay attention to your behavior and make sure that you have the right attitudes going into the experience. Um, so cultural humility was something that I heard mentioned by many of the people that we interviewed during my thesis study process. Um, that when a new volunteer professional from the Global North comes into the Global South, um, make, making sure that, that that person knows that they, they don't know everything and um, that this is a learning experience for them as well. And, and before they try to take leadership of initiative or offer their opinion um, about the way that a project is managed, they should first learn about the initiative and learn about the project and understand the culture and context um, before interrupting it with, with their own personal opinions and observations. Um, identifying your positionality and privilege, um, a really good quote that came from one of our interviewees was that privilege is not a mantle for praise. Um, so just because you studied in a world-renowned university doesn't mean that you should be praised for that once you're in a new context and set and situation where you have no previous experience. Um, instead, praise the people who have been there for eight years like Nancy, um, hands on doing the work day to day um, because they are the, the experts in that situation. Um, so, so really just like checking your, your privilege, your positionality, your motivations behind doing this work, um, and then making sure that you go out of your way to understand the context of the work. And um, so that's that second column. Um, we really would highly encourage any residents or volunteers or professionals um, to do a deep dive into the historical context and relationships between the country that you're going to visit and the country that you're from. Um, to make sure that you understand, like, like for me, something that's really important working in Latin America is understanding NAFTA um, and how that impacted local economies in the global south um, and how that impacts their social determinants of care. Um, and and I yeah, I'd like to just reinforce that I know that every global health professional that I've met has had really great intentions. Um, but also being someone from the global north and going through some really incredible learning curves, um, we all we all have something that we can always learn and and work on in in our work as global health professional. Um, and so a final quote to leave you with would be from Dr. Hugo Flores in Mexico, um, who said that when working with global health professionals from the north coming into the south into the context of of rural Mexico. And um, he said that everything that goes right comes from the mindset of the volunteer or the resident adapting to the place. And everything that goes wrong comes from the mindset of the place adapting to the volunteer or resident. Um, and a key example from that was having um, a, a medical resident, I think internal medicine, came to, to, per, to rural Mexico and went to one of our very rural clinics. Um, and was supposed to be doing bedside teaching with a social service year physician in the clinic um, and prevented the physician from, from giving treatments to their patients because they didn't feel like the diagnostic tools available were sufficient. Um, and yeah, so, so allow, allowing yourself time to observe and understand how, how the clinic is run and what kind of tools we do have available and how we make the diagnoses that we do before blocking treatment would have been um, the appropriate um, choice of action. Uh, so um, we don't have time for this now, but I can share the link as well in the chat. Um, I wanted to share a really cute video from Haiti made by Equal Health um, of Haitians sharing what they want professionals to know before you come to Haiti to, to volunteer. And I feel like while this is very focused on Haiti, it's very applicable to, to every global health site that I have visited or worked with in the last 10 years. Um, and then here's our reference site. I can share these materials with you if you'd like further reading info on the topic. And that leads us into about five minutes of questions. Does anyone have any questions for us today? About Decolonizing Global Health, about Partners in Health, this is Susan Salud, or Casita. 
Let me start first by thanking you. Really appreciate uh, Liberty and Nancy, both of the insights you've shared and the partnership you clearly have with one another and, and, and the great work that's happening in Casita. Um, as Liberty mentioned, the, the floor is open for questions. Uh, please feel free to, to come off mute, you know, um, share your camera if you can, and feel free to ask a question directly. Uh, we're also, we will be pasting into the chat a, a brief evaluation of the session, which would be great if, if folks can, can fill out. It's three questions, super short, but will help us inform our series going forward. Um, and maybe while we wait for some folks to uh, to ask some questions, uh, Nancy, if I can ask a question for you, um, Casita program just sounds so amazing, right? Um, and I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit more about the training for the community health workers and um, how long they're trained for, and um, if this is their full-time job. Uh, you know, we know there's many different models of community health workers uh, throughout the world, and and very curious just to hear a little bit more about the the setup and structure in in Socios and Salud. Okay, uh, do, uh, usually this training is during one month, but uh, the people that the community health worker. Uh, Come to the come to the office or in the field uh, two, ta two, two times of the week, and I think that the difference in the community in the how in the community worker in the work is how come identifying the community because with not only selection for the health center we identify with the leaders in the community how they can uh, uh, who are the people that have specific criteria in the community and can be involved in this process. And it's very interesting you now and um, discover uh, the characteristic of these people. And it's not usually the usual people, oh, okay, she helps, uh, she works with the children, but maybe other, other people can be to have these characteristics too. And the leader uh, bring the dates of these people. Um, the training is one month. And it's a theoretical uh, when we deliver uh, topics in nutrition, early childhood development, leaderships, uh, skill with uh, like to how to talk with the uh, other group of the mother, because usually this community health worker never talk with all the community. And then the practice. In the practice is, is other months, but depends of the how the community health workers feel trust in their activities because it can be only three sessions or maybe six sessions or more, but depends always when we talk with them and they, okay, you need more sessions, more practice? Yes, I need more. Okay, okay, okay. And we want, uh, want, and we discover every session what need to, to bring more support. I don't know if I... Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to echo what Soil said, thank you both. That was really a, a great presentation. Um, Liberty, this question actually is for you. For We have many, um, I think, trainees on the call today. Um, if they are interested in learning more, I saw that you shared several links in the chat. Um, if they're interested in getting involved, doing a rotation, finding out what is available, which of the um, links should they go to? Or should they email you directly? What would you prefer? Um, either way, so if they'd like to volunteer in Peru, that Center for Global Health link has, it's our our center's website, and there's more information about volunteering there, and we'll be posting, we're relaunching our international volunteer program officially in January, so so soon there will be like clinical rotations and such posted there that are available, um, and then any of the other PIH sites as well, uh, many of the sites publish their volunteer positions on the PIH website. Um, in the, the join our team link at the bottom, very bottom of the screen. Great. Um, well, I, maybe one more question, and then I think maybe we do have to, to wrap for the session. Um, a question for both of you. So you started um, talking about you know, the discrepancies in power and in funding structures from the global north to the global south. 
And then uh, for the funding of the Casita program, you were mentioning that a lot of it is funded from external uh, donors. And uh, with the grant, with the AVDI program, Nancy was mentioning uh, how it, it seemed like a, you know, a really open question to Socios and Salud, what do you want to do? Um, with grand challenges and with just the, the funding overall, uh, can you describe a little bit more if these are really models of allyship or you've you've really had to work with the funders and say, you know, this is our priority, let's find a way to make it, it work. Um, yeah, curious if you can expand on that. Yeah, so I can share kind of in general first and then Nancy, if you want to specify what your experience was like with Casita. Um, so in in general, it's my experience in, in looking for funding and applying for grants that most of the, the financiers that we work with have their own stated priorities that we then try and fit into. And, and sometimes we have to kind of like squeeze in there or adjust our programming and it generates a little bit of mission drift. But if it brings in a good chunk of financing, then then we feel like it's worth it. Um, and other times, and and this is this is really hard working with one of the sites in the Global South, but something that our site in, in Boston, our headquarters really reinforces is that that we can say no to financers. Um, we can turn down funding um, and temporarily put programs on hold if the financers aren't, if they don't align with our, our mission and with our needs and our priorities. Um, but that's that's harder said than done. Um, sometimes it feels easier to to change or shift our programming to to meet the financers' desires rather than to put things on hold and, and have our beneficiaries wait for more financing to come in. Um, but there are some, some financiers that are really incredible and really allow us to set the standards and allow us to say, like, they'll give us maybe a big bucket category and then we get to say, like, within that category, what's important to us. And, and those are the kind of financiers that, that I would love to work with more moving forward. Um, and I think GCC is, is a great example of one of those really open, open allies that allows us to set our priorities. Nancy, quieres agregar algo ahí? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, Nancy, you're on mute right now. <laughs> Completely agree with you. Liberty in relation to the Grand Challenge Canada is a, uh, per, a good, a good uh, institution for the brands final sport and they they are really uh received many comments of the of the people in the in the in the local institutions for example they want to uh they wanted uh the the leader of this intervention the pilot uh was peruvian not the international and when we presented the results of the pilot casita for to obtain the scaling up in in the two thousand 2016, they uh, I presented the experience, and in with my English, so I my English is not so good, but really I try to speak and I try to 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 understand so better now. Um, but they really what's so amazing, you know, th this experience and they trust in us, in the community, in the people, local, and that's it's very comfortable for us. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, thank you for sharing that. I'm glad to hear that that's working out well. Um, oh, we are at time. So um, if there are any questions or anything else I mentioned, would it be okay for us to, to um, channel those directly to, to both of you? Okay. Yeah. 